Well, thank you all for attending our September meeting of the Logic Sailing Club in 2021, where the wonders of remote access have come into play, and we're in the midst of the pandemic a little bit. Uh, we have the pleasure this evening of once again hearing from our friends down at Mystic Seaport. Uh, we're hearing a wonderful presentation on wooden boats and the art of making wooden boats in the day and age of everything not being wooden anymore. Um, very grateful that we're able to actually hear about how they can uh, be done with the wooden. So um, we, I got it. So, so um, I'd like to introduce Rebecca. Well, I think we may have lost Chris. <laughs> Can my Zoom friends hear me? Give me a wave if you can hear me. Okay, all right, so far so good. I think someone probably hit a button <laughs> somewhere in the room there, too much pizza. So give them a, a little moment maybe to uh, log back on. I see, it looks like Chris's cell phone is back up there. All right. Try there they again. are. <laughs> hey, that's what happens when three people try and do one thing on the computer, right? doesn't really work. So Rebecca, take it away and uh, I'll let you introduce Chris. Great. Sanders. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. And thanks so much for working out the in-person glitches and getting the whole microphone and speaker set up there for everyone who's there in person. Uh, so hello, everyone. Nice to see you all again. Good evening. Uh, Chris Sanders and I are broadcasting from beautiful Mystic Seaport Museum. Uh, we've had a great summer uh, and we're really just thrilled to be able to share um, this kind of aspect of what we do. Uh, so last we met, uh, Chris Freeman had taken you across uh, to our Collections Resource Center and we dive dive deep into the story of a yachtsman and uh, explorer and uh, kind of that world. And now we are definitely back in the seaport grounds, really talking about uh, the heart and soul of what we do here every day. Um, so I've got some images, I have some video, and Chris, I'm going to introduce him in just a moment officially. Uh, it's going to share about kind of what his life is like as a boat builder and a shipwright here at Mystic Seaport Museum. Uh, so just before we get started, just to kind of set the stage, um, what I love most about what we do here at Mystic Seaport Museum, certainly sharing maritime heritage, but also sharing the history of this particular community. Uh, so I grew up just down the river uh, in Noank, uh, and shipbuilding and that um, skill set has been a part of Mystic and Noank's history for generations, right? Um, so many of you maybe already know this, but uh, actually Mystic, the actual word, uh, is a Pequot uh, word for river that leads to the sea, uh, which doesn't surprise anyone why we would become a shipbuilder building um, uh, Mecca for art, period. So for Mystic, um, really in 1837, uh, three brothers, uh, Clark, Char uh, Charles, and um, George Greenman, uh, moved from their father's shipyard in Westerly to uh, the banks of the Mystic River. They found a nice bend in the river with a nice slope to launch a vessel, and of course, getting that great clear access to the sea. So a lot of ship um, yards sprung up around uh, the Mystic area, certainly the mouth of the Mystic River in Noank. Um, and what I just love about that, so the last vessel that was actually launched from the Mallory Shipyard, which is the site of our current um, shipyard, was in 1878. And not almost 100 years later in 1973, uh, the Seaport added the shipyard uh, to maintain those traditions and skills for our own fleet of vessels that we preserved and really to keep those kind of traditions alive. It is a really busy, gritty place. Um, and what I love about it, of course, is our guests are invited to come down there and check it out. And, you know, if you can get the attention of a shipwright, <laughs> right, he'll probably have this ear protection on uh, to kind of find out what's going on down there. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to take a little little dive. Um, I've got a little video just to kind of give an overview and a sense of place. Uh, and I'll introduce Chris, and then he's going to kind of take it away. All right. So let's see if I can get this screen uh, shared with everybody here. Uh, and I'm gonna need someone to unmute themselves and let me know you can see it because uh, once I go to sharing, I cannot see you all. All right, are we good? Can anyone, everyone see that? Um, yeah. Yes, we can see it. All right, wonderful. Yep. 
Um, so just, uh, again, so pleased to be here. Um, of course, many of you all know um, the Sixty Port Museum uh, for our flagship, the Charles W. Morgan picture to the left. Uh, some of our shipwrights uh, doing a demonstration of um, boat building. Actually, that was for a Viking uh, exhibit that we had here, and just a beautiful shot of um, uh, some parts of the Mayflower, which we will talk about in just a moment. Uh, let's see here. So uh, these are just some images I have snapped actually. Uh, the ship uh, yard is definitely a working place. So there are machinery and there is our vessels walking around. You've got to kind of look over your left shoulder because the actual work um, on these vessels is happening rain or shine. Um, we have a ship lift there on your left. We have uh, an exhibit gallery to kind of uh, give visitors a chance to learn a little bit more about the language and the lingo and the structures of vessels, as well as on the right there, a gallery where you can actually view um, our shipwrights in, um, in the, the carpentry shop. Uh, we have some really pretty cool looking saws, uh, both modern and old, and Chris can certainly give you all the details on those. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to say, when my dad comes to visit me, um, he's out on Long Island, and we spend the lion's share of our time every time uh, hanging out here to see what's going on, um, storing all types <laughs> of wood for different uh, portions of uh, the restoration work that we do. Uh, and again, like this is like the grit of, of what we do, which I just love. Um, here's just a brief video coming in just to give a ton of taste of the work we do every day. It's totally unique. It's the only museum shipyard in the country. And we let people right in to see what's going on. I think is amazing. We basically buy logs and we turn them into ship and boat parts. There's a tremendous amount of respect for the historical methods that were carried out before us and we try to duplicate things in kind, you know, make them look like the ships were when they were built. Right now, I'm supervising the restoration of the steamboat Sabino. I believe she's the last coal-fired wooden steamboat in the country that's certified to carry passengers. Today, I'm working on the rudder post for the Sabino, and I have a piece of locust that's eight feet long. And I used a skill saw to cut the hollow. But now I'm also picking up my chisel that's about 120 years old, that's got a curve in it, and I'm cutting the hollow with the chisel. The uh, Charles W. Morgan certainly was our really huge project. She's sort of our crown jewel. She's the biggest timber vessel here in the yard. We got the Mayflower in December, and this is the first time that we've done major work on another nonprofit's uh, a museum vessel. So the ship will go back to the uh, museum, and in six or eight months, we'll get her back, and we'll be able to do an extensive rebuild on her. What's fun uh, is the variety. It's just incredible. I love history. I love wood. And uh, I'm always trying to think about the lives of the men that used the ships 150 years ago or built them. I love it. Everyone was able to see that and hear that, I hope. We have good tech on that. Awesome, great. I got some thumbs up from everyone in my little Zoom windows here. Uh, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you the real deal, um, Chris Sanders, uh, who is, as I said, uh, just been promoted to our director of the Henry B. DuPont Preservation Shipyard. Uh, so I'm pretty sure his day has changed a lot since maybe <laughs> we uh, filmed some footage of him working in the yard. I think he's doing a lot more meetings than he might be would like. Um, but Chris is a native of Connecticut. Uh, he attended the University of North Carolina Carolina, where he studied physics and psychology before he began his career in wooden boat 
restoration and construction. Uh, so he's a graduate of the apprentice program at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, as well as the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, since his graduation, he's worked on restoration projects uh, in six states, uh, including several years in both Northern and Southern California, uh, ran his own boat restoration shop in San Diego for several years uh, before coming back home to Connecticut uh, with his wife, uh, Dr. Meg Megan McCarthy Sanders and their daughter Van. Uh, and we are certainly so glad to have him uh, as a part of our team. Um, so Chris, I was wondering if maybe you could just start us off. Um, I know we've got some video of you and some photographs on the grounds, but maybe to mm -hmm. tell us how you went from psychology and physics to boat building and what that was, what that trajectory was like for you. Sure. Yeah. Happy to. Um, let me just start by saying what a, what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here tonight. Um, I, uh, <laughs> my, my trajectory uh, throughout life has been, um, has been, has some 90 degree turns in it. Um, as, uh, as Rebecca said, I, um, I went to a college prep school. I went to, um, I went to a good college uh, liberal arts college and tried to find something that that struck a chord, you know, and um, I, uh, I changed majors, I think, seven times um, went from pre med to chemistry to biology to uh, Spanish to art history, and finally ended up with um, with uh, physics and psychology and um, I still remember this day like it was yesterday. I, I, I realized that I was lying to myself and I couldn't do it anymore. So um, <clears throat> I had been obsessed with wooden boats since I was very young, since I was about five years old. I also remember that day. It was the day that my father brought home a, uh, a model of the USS Constitution for the two of us to put together as a, as a father son uh, experience and um, I've been obsessed with boats ever since if you see uh, my notebooks from uh, middle school and high school they're just covered in drawings of J class yachts and 12 meters and stuff like that so um, so yeah I had a uh, I had a very long talk with my father um, um, just a little bit of background <clears throat> I am currently the only person in my nuclear family who's not a doctor um, <clears throat> so <laughs> That'll give you a little bit of a taste of how difficult this uh, this conversation was with my dad. But um, he finally uh, he just said, "Well, okay, what do we do?" And I said, "You know, I I, I want to work on wooden boats." And he said, "Chris, you don't know anything about wooden boats." And I said, "I know, but I want to change that." So um, I made some phone calls, and six weeks later. I started a boat building course with a gentleman named Danny Sutherland, and we built a um, we built a lolly tender for a racing yacht in um, <clears throat> in the Chesapeake Bay, and it was the greatest six weeks of my life up to that point. Um, this was at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, and um, had a great time there. and uh, while I was there, I applied to the International Yacht Restoration School in Newport, and um, <laughs> they called me and said, yes, I'd been accepted. And on the same day, the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum offered me a two-year apprenticeship um, working under a, a master shipwright. And um, so I actually deferred my time uh, <clears throat> at the International Yacht Restoration School to, to do my apprenticeship. and. Um, it was, um, I learned a lot. It, uh, <laughs> my, my master shipwright was very gruff. He was kind of rough around the edges, but um, he, uh, he taught me a lot. And um, I was very well prepared for when I actually did go to the International Yacht Restoration School. Um, after that, I, I held a journeyman position, which is not quite a master, not quite a novice. Uh, I worked on a, um, a Chesapeake Bay boat called a skipjack for, for quite a while. We uh, restored her from, uh, from the ground up. And um, 
you know, as Rebecca said, after that, um, I just kind of bounced around to wherever the work was. You know, I, I went from Connecticut to Rhode Island to Massachusetts, back to Maryland, North Carolina, back to Rhode Island, um, went out went out west with uh, my to be wife. Um, she was actually she was chasing a, um, a residency in veterinary medicine. That's how I ended up in California. It was uh, I got to work for some very talented people. So that was uh, that was lovely. But, um, you know, I might also um, while I have your attention, I uh, something that Walt said, you know, he said that he's interested in in preserving the, you know, the um, the techniques of the past and whatnot. And I just something that really working at Mystic Seaport really strikes a chord with me is that there is an unbroken chain from my generation all the way back to the beginning of boat building in New England. Um, you know, the, the first shipwrights that worked at Mystic Seaport were the last generation that built the schooners out of Essex and Gloucester, and they passed their knowledge to the next generation, which happened to be Walter's generation. Walter has been a mentor of mine um, for my entire career. He was actually an instructor of mine at the, the International Yacht Restoration School. And I, um, I consider myself very blessed to, to work with him every single day, but um, just, a, just a lovely guy. And uh, so, you know, I, I had a hard time actually uh, sort of reconciling leaving college to, to build boats, but I think uh, I, I kind of look back on it now as one of my proudest moments. So. <laughs> awesome, Chris. I'm going to share my screen and maybe you could, I don't know that many of us actually know what a day in your life is like. I think we have all sure. very different uh, experience. I know I certainly, we work at the same museum. I have a very different day than you do. Sure. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to share my screen here. If you could, I think the first shot actually is the photograph that you took uh, as you start your day here at Mystic Seaport Museum. Yeah, so this is um, this is five o'clock in the morning. Um, I um, <laughs> I'm one of those fortunate few people who really really love what they do. So um, my mental alarm goes off at about uh, three forty five four a.m. and uh, I come into work and you know I sharpen my tools or I you know I have um, I have some hobbies of mine. I make uh, I make caulking mallets and that kind of stuff. Uh, woodworking is quite addictive if uh, if you're not a woodworker just uh, just a warning but um, yeah this is this is walking into my office uh, yesterday morning <laughs> great all right and so how so do you guys start with like a, a meeting or something Chris or uh, how does yeah. the day for everyone in the yard start so uh 7 a.m we sort of have a, a group muster and then um we we sort of plan out what's going on for the next couple of weeks, but um, you know, by and large, everybody that comes to the meeting already knows what they're doing for the day. Um, and the the reason being that in boat building, um, my my master shipwright actually once told me he said, Chris, boat building is all about phases. There are you know, there's building the backbone, there's planking, there's framing, there's decking, there's caulking. And every one of these phases lasts just long enough that you think about quitting <laughs> and then it's over and then you move on to the next phase. So, um, you know, most of the people already know what they're doing. You know, they know the schedule. It's, it's, we work from 7 a.m. until 3.30. Um, but, um, you know, as, as you can see, some of the boats that we work on are, are quite large. So, um, you know, it does uh, taking taking a log, which we which we uh, we get a lot of, and turning it into a plank, which you you see in this photo, um, can take several days. And um, it's you know it usually involves a couple of sawmills, and in, including the uh, the chase mill that you saw in um, in Walt's uh, slideshow. But uh, you know, it goes from. Uh, a sawmill to power tools, um, but the the funny thing is that in you know in this day and age we have so much technology. There are still 
there there's nothing that does fine woodworking better than hand tools you know the last five percent of anything that goes onto a boat is with a hand tool you know something something like this just a hand plane or um in our case it um sometimes you know this is this is the size chisel that we use but uh it's still a chisel, you know, there's no, there's no extension cord on this one. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's always, it, the last final fitting, that kind of stuff is always about hand tools. So. And you've got other people too, besides just shipwrights, right? Riggers are a part of your shipyard team. What are some other jobs of, of people down there with you? Yeah, um, so we actually have a dedicated rigging team. That is, um, that's, that's all they do. Um, we uh, we also have a a finish crew. They uh, they do all the painting and the varnishing and and stuff like that. Um, the uh, one of the one of the more recent developments for a uh, a shipwright is you know a hundred years ago um, they would have been they would have had concentrations where they would have learned at a very young age, probably seven or eight years old, how to use. A certain tool, whether it's a hewing axe or a hand plane or something like that, and that was more often than not, if you went to a commercial yard, that was all that you did. You know, you did it ten hours a day, six days a week, and you got really good at it, which is why they could turn out a boat like the Charles W. Morgan in three months. Um, but uh, you know, in this day and age, we we have to be good at a lot of different disciplines you know we have to be able to do finish work painting and varnishing and whatnot we have to be very good carpenters uh we have to be good caulkers we have to know a little bit about rigging that kind of thing so it's um yeah it's it's definitely a multifaceted place we have teams of people running around doing all kinds of stuff <laughs> Awesome. Well, all right. I've got a video actually of Chris uh, demonstrating some of the skills uh, that uh, he has learned in other shipwrights. So it's a, just about six minutes. So I'll go ahead and plug that in. Then we'll pop on back and, and certainly maybe get some questions or, or some other, other things that we can talk about. So here we go. Oops. Sorry about that, hold on. I hit the wrong button. Hi, I'm Christopher Sanders. I'm one of the shipwrights here at Mystic Seaport. And uh, I'm just gonna show you a little bit about uh, what I've been up to today. Um, preparing this log with uh, traditional timber framing techniques and uh, going to show you some of the tools that I used and uh, some of the methods that I used. So this is for our latest exhibit in the Thompson Gallery. Um, it's a, uh, a salute to wood. And um, I basically took a round log, um, still had bark on it and everything else, um, and used traditional methods to make it square and then cut it down to shape uh, and turn it into timbers that would be used in shipbuilding. One of the first things you do with a tree uh, is you cut it into what are known as cants. And that's just a word that means square timbers of sort of nonspecific use. You can take these cants uh, after you've made them square and you can stack them for later use. Um, it makes it quite easy to um, to take templates and lay it on the piece to see if your, your uh, future piece that you need will actually come out of that piece that you have. The first thing you do is you cut these notches um, using a scoring axe, which is in America is more often than not is, a, uh, is just a, a standard American felling axe. Um, but these, uh, these notches, the bottom of the notches will dictate where the plane that you're trying to achieve actually will be. So uh, after cutting a series of notches across the log, uh, you then use what's known as a jogging axe, which is a big, heavy thing. Um, I, think, I think mine weighs about eight pounds. And uh, you break these big chunks off, and it's, uh, it's quite an effective way to, uh, 
to, um, to remove a lot of stock very, very quickly. Um, from there, I used a, uh, a gutter ads, which is um, a, an ads with a lot, a lot of shape to it. It's usually about a four or five inch radius. And um, I, I cut these trenches down to uh, the bottom of the trench would be roughly where the finished uh, plane would be. From there, I used a series of adzes, usually straight adzes like this. Uh, I used what's known as a lipped adz, uh, which is a, an American uh, style uh, shipwrights adz, to sort of clarify that surface. And from there, you can see I, uh, I used a scrub plane. And after that, I used a smoothing plane. And you'll see that the, the finish is quite nice um, on the end. Very little has changed in um, shipbuilding in the last uh, two or 300 years. The, the last real leap forward was the invention of electricity uh, for us. So um, the, uh, the difference today would be that we would have mechanized most of this. Um, there are certain parts of this that um, we have not found tools that can do that. So um, we would be using a sawmill to get to about here, um, where you would have a rough cant, and um, that would be fairly quick. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, there would be a team of guys, and that's, this is all they would do is square timbers, and they were quite good at it, but they were, there were quite a few of them too, so they were fast, but they were, there were, uh, there were lots of guys working at once. The, the end result is done with, with hand tools even today. Um, there are things about shipbuilding, mainly curves, that, um, that machines don't do real well. So we have a real problem with, um, you know, cutting uh, concave curves in particular, you know, table saws, circular saws, they really don't like to do that. So um, what we do is we do the, well, we do the best we can. We, we cut as close to the line as we can, but we're always finishing that piece with hand tools. Um, it's about the only way that you can get the, um, the level of precision that you need uh, is to sort of creep up on it with your hand tools. Well, uh, you know, Mystic Seaport is, uh, is a pretty amazing place. It's kind of a, kind of a time capsule, if you think about it. Um, there are schools all across the country where uh, this trade is being taught, and um, at Mystic Seaport, it was never actually lost. It was just sort of passed on from generation to generation. You know, we had, uh, we had guys that built schooners for fishing out of Boston and, and whatnot um, working here. And they pass the knowledge on to um, the next generation and the next generation. And I, hopefully I will learn from uh, the masters like Walt Ansel. One of the things that makes this place unique is uh, we have the greatest facilities I have ever seen. And I've been pretty fortunate. I've lived all over this country working on boats all over the place. And I remember when I first got here and I saw our, our ship lift and our main shop, which is behind me. Um, I was blown away. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, there are quite a few places um, out west, but uh, nothing on the scale that we have here. It's really, it's pretty amazing what we have here. There are wooden ships of great importance all over the world. And I think it's important that this trade um, be kept alive and, and, and flourish uh, in order to, to take care of those, those ships. Um, here at Mystic Seaport, we've got dozens of them. And you know, without the work that we're doing here at the DuPont shipyard, um, they would deteriorate very, very quickly. Good job on that, Chris. You did a great job with that video. Um, so I actually, before I'm going to stop sharing just for a quick second, I've got some images of just some different vessels that um, you've worked on while you, since you've been here, Chris. Yeah. I certainly want to give an opportunity if people have any questions right now, but I know, so I think I've seen that video probably 10 times. I love it. And I just had a question that I've never even thought to ask you about. Sure. That. 
where does a shipwright get his amazing specific tools? Like that is definitely not something that you could find in Home Depot. So, so what's, you had a whole trough of different types of axes and adzes. How do you come by that? <laughs> you know, uh, very good question. Um, you know, again, I, um, I'm, I love what I do. I'm obsessed with the tools of the trade and whatnot. So um, for a younger, newer shipwright, um, I'm actually who they get their tools from. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I've actually amassed quite a collection over the years. And, um, you know, you have to you have to know about those little tiny, you know, antique stores that get shipments, uh, you know, from uh, from estate sales and stuff like that. It's, um, you know, the uh, the funny thing is, I I'm looking around my office and I'm I'm surrounded by you know by tools like this and um, the the quality of of hand tools fell off after World War II. Um, you know, the um, mechanization of, of methods and whatnot um, kind of put them on the back burner. So, you know, to, to, to look for tools like this, you really got to go digging. And this one in particular is probably, um, probably 1870s. Um, most of my, my timber framing chisels are, are 1880s or 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, that was back when people made tools that would last that certain craftsman a lifetime, you know, stuff like this. This thing is, uh, is about 24 inches across. Um, and um, so, so you have you know, to know how to maintain those then as a shipwright as well, right? Absolutely, yes. You know, the, um, you know, sharpening tools is a skill unto itself. And it's something that I actually teach classes in because I think it's so important. Uh, but yes, maintenance of your own tools, your, your tools are only an extension of your hand and they, the quality of the tools actually is a direct upshot of, of how, um, you, your, your work is only as good as your tools. That's, um, you know, it's the best I can say it. So, um, I invest very heavily in my tools, but it's, it's, um, you know, I also, I also care deeply about, uh, you know, passing tools like this on to the next generation because, so That's I have a, a cool. really like logistical question. Um, I work in the office most of the time. I have a favorite pen. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you guys all organize like your tools among the shipwrights? Does everyone bring their own toolbox in? Do you have storage down there? Or how, do, how does that work? Like, just we we do. Yeah, there, there's actually, I mean, there is a kit that you are more or less required to have. Um, we don't share very often because... <laughs> You know, it's I, I don't know if you've ever heard the old saying, like, you don't you don't lend uh, another guy your girl or your chainsaw because they never come back the same. Um, <laughs> and that that is the honest truth. I mean, you you know, you give somebody a, a chisel and seven times out of ten, it's going to come back with a chip in the edge or something. You know, it just um, and, you know, if somebody asks you to borrow a tool from you more often than not, they're they're a newbie that doesn't know. And, um, you know, you can forgive them for it, but uh, you still don't let them borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, great. Well, let's, uh, I'm just going to just pause and see if there's any questions yet. And then I thought I would just shoot some pictures um, sure. of some of the projects. I know the Mayflower 2 was the first mm -hmm. project that brought you to Mystic Seaport Museum. We've got some great, yeah. uh, um, great shots of that. But before I go back to sharing, I'm just going to scan there if anyone on my Zoom windows have a question or anything at this point in time. Uh, Sanders Lederman, yes, go ahead. If you unmute yourself, you can just go ahead and ask away. I was right. lucky enough to see, can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to see the Shenandoah, the Mayflower too, and the DuPont uh, and, the, and the Morgan uh, all on the hard. Uh, and about a month ago, we had some out of state visitors and we visited the Mayflower. And I just want to say hats off to you guys. For those of you who have not been on the Mayflower since it was rebuilt, it is magnificent. Um, and, and that just really, I don't know how many people who haven't seen it, but it, it's really worth a visit. Um, two quick questions, Chris. Sure. Um, if somebody has a tree that looks like it might be something that could be usable for you folks, mm -hmm. uh, is there a way, 
can you give us an email so we could send you a, a, a photograph and, and find out if it's something you could use? Absolutely, yes. Um, Chris.Sanders, um, C-H-R-I-S dot S-A-N-D-E-R-S at mysticseaport.org. I threw it in the chat there for everyone uh, who's visiting too. And actually, Chris, uh, Sanders, I think that we should uh, get you on the payroll here because you lead to a great question too. Because um, the story about how the shipyard um, gets the wood used for the restorations, I mean, that is another whole 45 minute presentation in itself. But Chris, can you speak just, maybe just briefly about that? It's a fascinating story. Absolutely, sure. Um, you know, with, uh, I'll just use Mayflower too as an example. Um, she's built primarily of uh, four or five different kinds of wood, depending on the location in the boat. Uh, primarily live oak, white oak, yellow pine, and Douglas fir. Um, we, more often than not, we get our live oak from uh, places like Georgia and Florida. And it's, it's almost, um, it's kind of difficult to find because people are quite hesitant to, to just cut it down. So quite often we will get it from uh, storm damage, you know, the last couple hurricanes, uh, you know, some trees go down and we get phone calls from, you know, a town or a municipality that's, uh, you know, that has a tree down and they say, would you like it, you know, this tree? So we go down there and we harvest it. Um, but uh, with, uh, with white oak, we usually find everything we need in in Connecticut. Um, you know, the the northeast corner, the northwest corner of the state have very big stands of uh, very very large white oak. So that's um, it's actually um, the most that is the most prevalent wood that you'll see, especially in this this picture that you see before you, the, um, the Mayflower too. Uh, her the majority of her hull planking below her bulwarks is, is white oak. And um, a lot of it is, uh, is Connecticut white oak. We also were quite fortunate to, um, to get a, uh, several shipments of white oak from the Royal Forests of Denmark. Um, I, I believe the, uh, the King and Queen of Denmark heard about the, uh, the restoration and were quite eager to help. So we got, these containers and I still remember opening up the doors and there were these pieces that were like they were 48 inches wide they were four inches thick and they were 40 feet long and there was not a single knot or check in them and I grabbed the younger guys and I said boys take a look because you will never see wood like this ever again and so she's planked in some of the finest the finest white oak in the world um yeah the um the live oak that you you saw in the in the previous photo for the um, the lower framing, um, the majority of that came from um, either Hurricane Hugo or um, uh, I guess it was uh, the one in two thousand six that knocked down a, a bunch of stuff in Georgia. So I'm going to go back to so we'll, let's take a look at, at the Mayflower project then too. So the pictures that you're seeing, of course, are as how she she came to us. Um, Let's see here, I'll get back to that one. So she was in pretty rough shape, wouldn't you say, Chris, from your expert eyes? Yes, yes. Um, the, the photo on the left you're seeing, this is immediately after we removed all of her concrete ballast. So um, you, you see some of her stringers uh, leading aft. The, the concrete was up to that level. So we removed um, probably 50 tons of, of cement just uh, with a jackhammer and uh, hammer and chisel and stuff like that. That was, that was a rough couple of months. Um, <laughs> but, uh, most of what you see on the left is actually English oak. Um, she was primarily built of English oak uh, in 1956 and 57, um, which to be honest, was her saving grace. Uh, English oak is, uh, is tenacious when it comes to uh, resisting bug damage and rot and uh, mold and spores and creepy crawlies and that kind of stuff. It's um, it does it does quite well uh, in that respect. So that's that's what you're seeing right there on the left. Um, on the right, you'll see that uh, yeah, her planking was was a little bit on the kind of sad looking. So um, with a restoration this big, um, you are also 
sort of uh, trying to keep the the shape of the boat. So, you know, if you tear a bunch of the structure out of a boat, it tends to sag a little bit and that kind of thing. And we're doing our best not to do that. So um, it's one of the primary reasons why a restoration takes so long is you're actually, you're literally taking one piece off and putting a new piece on. So uh, this is our main shop. You're, you're looking down at one, two, three. You're looking at four of the, um, the primary pieces of, um, of Mayflower 2 stem. Uh, I don't know if you remember during the slideshow earlier, uh, but there was a, a picture of the, the stem knee. It was this gigantic uh, um, stem uh, knee in the, uh, in, you're actually looking at that. That's, that's dead center. That was before I started shaping it. Um, but uh, the big curvy piece is uh, Mayflower 2's outer stem. And the pieces, it's kind of tough to tell. The, the central piece there is almost 14 feet long. Um, now, finding pieces of wood that big is not necessarily difficult. Finding pieces of wood that are both healthy and that big are quite difficult. Um, it was 14 inches by 14 inches by 14 feet which usually means, especially with the curve that was in it, that you're going to have to deal with the heart of the tree at some point. Uh, the heart of a white oak is always the part that you kind of dread because it's full of rot and bugs and all kinds of stuff. So, um, and I'll, I'll, the, the deck beam that you see in sort of the top left um, was actually clear of the heart, which, is, which is, um, gives you an idea of how big the, the tree was. So. You, um, double the size of that deck beam and then add six inches for the, uh, for the heart. And that'll give you an idea of the tree that came from. But um, with the stem, um, it was uh, like you saw, it was several pieces. I think the smallest piece was, was about 2,200 pounds. Um, I think the, the largest one was closer to 3,700 pounds. And um, we, uh, we fabricated it on the ground and then we raised it into place um, piece at a time. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that took us close to 10 months from start to finish. Um, finding the wood, fabricating, making sure that the joinery, which actually pokes through um, into, the, into the water was, was watertight and then raising it into place and making sure that nothing had shifted. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that was um, that was actually the first job I was given on Mayflower too. So that uh, I was kind of thrown into the deep end. <laughs> um, this is the breast hook uh, on the tween deck for Mayflower. So you're looking at live oak. Um, for those of you who don't know about live oak, it's about thirty to forty percent denser and stronger than white oak. So uh, if you get a nice um, a nice piece out of a, out of a tree, it sinks like a rock. I think it's specific gravity is like 1.06 or something like that. But um, the, the great thing about live oak is that um, it has some strange characteristics. It's very, very strong, um, except the crushing strength is actually comparatively quite low. So um, if anybody's ever heard of the, um, the USS Constitution's nickname, Old Ironsides. Uh, she was originally planked. Her outer planking was originally live oak. And when the British fired volleys at her, the, the, the wood didn't actually break and shatter into the boat as, as white oak typically does. It actually sort of gave kind of like a, a boxer rolling with a punch and the cannonballs fell away. And, you know, sort of thus was born the uh, the legend that she was built out of iron. So it's just, a, it's a weird characteristic of live oak, but, but a very important one. Yeah, so this is the, uh, this is the outer stem that I was, I was just talking about. The, the, uh, the very top, the tip top is, is the closest end uh, to us in this photo. Um, the, uh, the piece that you're looking at uh, closest to us is, is made out of white oak. Uh, the middle and the lower pieces um, were made out of live oak. So um, I believe the, uh, the top piece, the closest to us, is the, is the real, real heavy one. I think we ended up getting a crane to put that one in because it was so big. And, you know, um, if you've ever seen Mayflower out of the water, um, 
you're sort of blown away by how tall she is. You know, it's just, she's built sort of straight up. So the very tip top of this stem was close to 35 feet off the ground. So we, we didn't actually have the, the capability to do that. I think we got a crane to, to lower that piece in place. <laughs> yeah, and there it is. That's, um, that's the stem in place. Um, you're also looking at the, um, that sort of recurve at the very top is the, uh, is the gammon knee, which uh, ironically enough was, um, was a, um, a piece that we made out of a donation from the USS Constitution Museum. Um, it was the only, it was the only piece that, um, let me think, it was the only piece that actually was, um, was laminated in the entire construction. Um, so the uh, USS Constitution Museum, the boat is almost twice as long as Mayflower and uh, comparatively much more stoutly built. So I think this was one of their, um, I believe this was one of their standing knees that was, uh, that was recycled for the gammon knee. And yeah, there she is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see, after, after the framing, um, Scott and I, my, he's my, one of my coworkers, we kind of, we, you sort of just settle into teams um, because, the, um, because of the scale that we work on. So Scott and I work um, together almost every day. And um, we, um, we sort of bounced around the boat, sort of putting out the biggest fire at any given time. So uh, we started out on the tween deck and we were doing decking and ceiling planks and hanging knees. And then we moved down into the hold. And um, the, the last real big hurdle was uh, was the beak head, the sort of uh, you know the the thing uh, protruding from the front of Mayflower, and they said, "Listen, we've got two months to build this thing. You know, you guys just do it." So <laughs> we we looked at the old one. We actually had the old one, and it was in such terrible shape. We said, "You know, this is this is useless." More often than not, we would pattern off of it and try and recreate the shape, but. We also compared it to um, to Baker's original drawings of Mayflower and found that they had nothing to do with each other. So we started from from Baker's drawings. We lofted it out and we built it exactly the way that he had intended uh, when he drew it in the 1950s. So that's we're we're quite happy with the way that the the beak head came out. Yeah, that was a, a great day. Launch day was it was a great day. It was great to see her her head to her new home. Just beautiful. And you know, people often ask me when when she was with us, like, you know, why is she so colorful? Why is she, you know, whatever? And is those her real colors? That doesn't seem right. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, the colors they were often they were merchant vessels, right? So a, yep. a well kept uh, ship and a brightly colored ship is going to attract customers. So that's right. We don't well, know right for sure, right? It's it's likely she was brightly colored originally right yeah. Chris imagine imagine you're in a town in the south of England and it's full of merchant ships and they say okay you have to go to Mayflower and there's a thousand other boats exactly the same size sitting at anchor in the same harbor and you have to find out which one it is so what they would do is they would color code their own boats so uh, what you're seeing on Mayflower is quite bland compared to what she probably looked like there's probably a lot of scroll work and filigree and stuff like that you know gold leaf um, and that helped to yes you work as sort of a billboard and also it helped to uh, um, sort of set themselves apart from the rest of the fleet awesome thanks Chris mm -hmm. All right, I think I'm just going to fly through some of these other just other um works that you have you've worked on since you, you've been here the, yeah. the Sherman's Wicker of course was a big one um mm -hmm. I'll let you just state maybe a few words and then we'll power through to the end and then take some more questions how does that sound yeah. uh Zwicker came to us from New York City she was uh built in 1942 she's about 150 feet long she was the biggest boat we've ever hauled at Mystic Seaport um you can see the way she overhangs her cradle by quite a lot uh, we did a lot of planking uh, she's happily back in the water. She's coming back in about two months for some, uh, some scheduled maintenance. Um, yeah, you can see just the size of the boat there. That <laughs> Liberator, um, our vice president, Chris Gashorek, uh, is a, both an alum and a former instructor at uh, the Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point. So last summer, he got a phone call from some of his, uh, his old cronies that said, uh, hey, Liberator needs some work. And he said, okay, bring it over. So we, um, 
kind of got outside our comfort zone and did a lot of, of uh, work on, she's cold molded. Um, she was actually built um, exactly like a minesweeper. So uh, a lot of laminating and, and stuff like that. So that was, that was an interesting, interesting project. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of painting on that one. Hey, yeah, there's Morgan. <laughs> so she's looking kind of stubby here, Chris. Talk us through this. Yeah. She's not looking so so glorious in this shot. Yeah. So we hauled Morgan uh, about six weeks ago, and um, we were planning on just taking her up. And um, I, you can see uh, it's called a shave and a haircut. It basically just means a scrape, a paint, and put her back in the water. Um, but boats this big, wooden boats, are, are happiest in the water. Um, we downrigged her before we hauled her out for two reasons. One, because it reduced her tonnage by quite a lot. And that actually helped us uh, with the haul out. And also, uh, we found a fair amount of rot in her bowsprit, which uh, was kind of unexpected. But um, we immediately started with a plan to replace the bowsprit. She'll have a new bowsprit by probably December, and uh, she'll be fully rigged by April of next year. Cool. Well, I can't leave everyone looking at her like that. So we've got one little glamour <laughs> shot of Morgan when she went yeah. on her, her voyage in 2014, looking glamorous and glorious. And uh, I'm going to stop my share right now and just see if we have any other questions in the gallery there or um, see what we've got. So again, if you have any questions on, on site there, you can go up to the microphone or uh, if anyone in my Zoom window wants to has a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, Peg, go ahead. I'm curious how physics and uh, the the training you've gotten in psychology have put you where you are. Good question. Um, it's funny the um, the physics part actually helps a lot because we're uh, you know we kind of. I use mostly trigonometry and algebra on a daily basis, but um, you know, every once in a while, you know, a little bit of calculus helps. There's, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out uh, wetted surface and stuff like that. And um, so that that does help. Just just having a, a mind that works with numbers is very, very helpful. Um, more importantly, actually, is um, you cannot be a boat builder if you don't have a developed spatial IQ. So you need to be able to mentally create an object and rotate it around and see what it looks like from different different uh, perspectives. Wow. Um, so that, that honestly, I, I've run into people that don't have that and they wanted desperately to be a shipwright and they just didn't have it. They, they kind of washed out, it was kind of sad. But um, with psychology, um, after looking at the slideshow and looking at the videos, um, you guys probably have a sneaking suspicion that we're not right in the head. And um, so it, it kind of helps to, uh, you know, they say it takes one to know one. And um, so it, it does help. We have, there's a lot of strong personalities in this industry and um, it, it kind of helps to know what you're dealing with. So um, yeah, I, um, I actually do use that pretty much every day it's it is strange but uh yeah great answer <laughs> great answer thank you thank you thank you i appreciate it <laughs> oh. Hello. i can hear you oh hi chris uh frank over here at new york club uh, i've got a question now going back to when you were squaring that log at the beginning I noticed you were um, pulling the plane. Yes. Um, is that a special plane? I, I didn't get a good look at it. So that was actually, okay, so that's a scrub plane. Um, and if you'll bear with me, I'm going to grab one. Uh, give me like two seconds. We can always use more tools. Good question there. Yeah. So, okay, so a scrub plane is, is the roughest of hand planes. There's also a furring plane, but it's really rare. You never see it. So this is a scrub plane. And do you see the bottom is actually convex? 
So what it does is it takes these really deep shavings and it actually takes quite a lot of effort to use one. You got to kind of bear down and you got to push really hard. And with a log, sometimes you just don't want to jump over to the other side so that you're going with the grain. So with, this is actually, uh, this is a continental style plane. You'll see a little horn up here. Uh, so it's kind of goes like this. Um, when you're when you're flattening like that, you're actually you're trying to go with the grain. You're trying to go more or less 45 degrees off the, the grain. Sometimes the grain will actually dip down and come back up, and you just sort of flip it around and you, and you deal with it instead of jumping across the log and uh, and going from the other direction. It's um, you know it's it's Japanese tools actually are built to to work on the pull stroke. Um, the Japanese uh, Japanese hand plane. Um, European Western style tools are actually meant to be pushed more often than not, but they do work uh, on the pull stroke as well. Take the blade out of that plane. Could you take the blade out? This guy? Yeah. Because yeah, I think I have a whole box of those. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Uh, Chris.Sanders at mysticseaport.org, my friend. <laughs> well, let's see if I can see the, the convex grind on that one. I didn't know what to do. I think if you can turn it to the side, maybe, Chris. There we go. Yeah, that's, um, that's a scrub plane blade. It, um, there, there are two different kind of curved planes, actually. The, there's a backing out plane, which is this blade, but a flat bottom. And then there's the scrub plane, which has the, the uh, convex bottom and the convex grind. So. Now, Chris, are you a sailor at all yourself? I am. I, uh, gosh, I have, I have fond memories of, of sailing. I am. Um, <laughs> uh, they don't let us out of the shipyard very often. Um, it, uh, you know, wooden wooden boats are um, sort of an all-consuming. You sort of have to basically admit that you're not going to have a, a social life. Um, and I, you know, I I grew up sailing as much as I could, and I loved Newport because I got to go racing on twelve meters and big schooners and stuff like that. But um, yeah, no, I. It's uh, sailing is, it's it's just the best. <laughs> uh, any other questions there from anyone before before we sign off and let you all get on to the rest of your evening? Uh, whoops, I, I can't quite hear you uh, in the in the room there. Uh, still having some trouble, my friend. Maybe uh, Chris Shea, can you can you help out with that? Okay, how about that? Does that help? Yes, yep. thank you. Okay, the um, Mayflower 2 seems like it's very top heavy. It's very tall and very thin. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing the Pride of Baltimore the, about a week before they lost her, and mm -hmm. she was all tall. Is she tall, or how do you determine how, you know, the stability of that? Yeah, so... Um... That was actually my first instinct too. Um, <laughs> when I first saw Mayflower, in fact, the um, the photo in the slideshow of of Mayflower two, um, she's sort of looking kind of kind of sad, and she's up on the hard uh, with no rig in her. That was that was one of the photos I took on the first day I got to Mystic Seaport, and from the bottom of her keel to the top of her stern castle, she's over forty feet. And she's only, I think, 89 feet on deck. So, I mean, she's half as tall as she is long. Uh, weird looking boat, right? So the, the difference is that most of the timbers below the waterline in Mayflower 2 are roughly 30 to 50% bigger than the timbers that are above the waterline. Um, we also... Uh, we the planking below the waterline was close to three inches thick. 
So, so about like that. Uh, above the waterline, it got gradually smaller and smaller as it went up. I think it stopped at about an inch and a half thick uh, at the very top of the stern castle. Um, we also ended up putting close to 130 tons of lead in Mayflower II, which was still to this day, maybe the worst uh, seven days of my life. Um, so the, the lead came in 60 pound ingots about this big. And it was, I think it was in the middle of July. So it was about 140 degrees down in the, in the hold. And we have this, uh, you know, we have this uh, <laughs> bucket brigade of guys just going back and forth with, uh, with lead ingots for honest to God a week. Um, and um, so, yeah, about 130 tons or so to offset the, uh, the height of the boat. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that was, that was pretty typical. You know, they, they looked at Baker's drawings um, through a modern lens and they, um, they basically said William Baker got it right. You know, uh, Mayflower II is a very, very accurate representation of a, of a 17th century merchant vessel. So um, I think that was pretty much the, uh, the norm for that, for that day and age. Thanks, Chris. Have you been approached by Advil to be a spokesperson for them or? It's, you know, it's funny. I, um, I, I keep a, a very large jar of it in my office and it's, um, you know, it, I tell people, you know, I think about Mayflower too, and I actually, my back starts hurting because, uh, just muscle memory. It's, um, it's one of those projects really that, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my experience for anything in the world, but man, am I glad it's over. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Chris. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, Chris Shea, is everyone, is any other questions in the galley there or? or... Uh, we, we can't quite hear you, Chris. I was going to ask a question. You posted this video the other night. Um, do you actually, and I know this is probably a loaded question, have a boat that you most enjoyed working upon? You know, I do. Um, I don't know. That's why I asked. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> I um, you know, before I got to Mystic Seaport, my, my sort of bread and butter was uh, classic 1920s and 1930s racing yachts. You know, long overhangs, way too much sail area, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, 12 meters and eight meters. And um, I worked on a couple of R-class boats, which are just the most heart achingly beautiful boats. Um, and uh, I've been actually sort of half-heartedly trying to track down an R-class that I worked on because uh, she her proportions she i mean she had 16 inches of freeboard she was 39 feet long and she had a 24 and a half foot water line so that just gives you an idea of how graceful and long and delicate this boat was and she went like smoke i mean she was the fastest thing i've ever ever sailed on at least it felt like it obviously you guys know what i'm talking about um but uh, just 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 a heartbreaking beautiful elegant boat that was that was my my favorite one yeah <laughs> uh chris uh daryl street here i'm vice commodore in the club i uh, i got a chance to work back in the 80s and building uh the uh spirit of massachusetts oh. and uh they they actually took volunteers you know mm -hmm. and that, uh, for the weekends anyway Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. Uh, one, one point I'd like you to talk a little bit about is the uh, cutting the bevels of frames. The frames are uh, solid. But on top of that, also, if you could touch base on the matter of the sad situation with a lot of vessels of her type, uh, yep. fact, Virginia, a lot of these boats are built and then, you know, they either get to an age where they can't maintain them anymore. There's just mm -hmm. the park has sort of fallen off. And, you yeah. know, the school races in Gloucester are not what they used to be. Let's face it. That's right. Yeah. Um, so cutting uh, cutting bevels on double sawn frames is, um, is one of the more harrowing um, endeavors that you can, you can embark on in, in boat building. And um, 
And one of the reasons why is, um, especially if they're if they're large, long frames, uh, large, long futtocks rather, um, the more often than not, the bevel where the frame meets the planking, it actually rolls. So the, you know, you go down the boat and it actually tucks in a little bit or it curls out. Um, so one thing that you do when you're when you're restoring a boat, um, you you pull the old frame out. You use a bevel gauge to register the uh, the bevel on. You usually divide the um, the length of the futtock and you know into feet or six inches or or what have you. You register those. You transfer it to your new piece, and then um, <clears throat> if you've got a buddy that you really trust, I I usually just take my my futtock stock and I run it through a ship saw, which is basically a, a gigantic. Uh, band saw um, where you can actually tilt the head of the, the saw and you can cut rolling bevels. If you have a buddy who's, who's you're sort of in tune with, he's sitting there cranking the head of the saw over while you're pushing the wood through. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. Um, so that's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, as, for, as for large timber framed vessels in this day and age, yes. Um, the, the sad reality is that these boats are built with the best of intentions. And you have people that really believe in the mission statements and you have people that, that uh, you know, they give their time and they give, uh, you know, um, they forego family time and, and money to, you know, to be part of a, a vessel such as that. And, um, most of them don't make it. it um, it's incredibly expensive to, to maintain a sailing vessel like Spirit of Massachusetts, uh, let alone campaign it, take it around and, and enter it into races and festivals and stuff like that. Um, you're talking about paying a crew. You're talking about uh, buying supplies. You're talking about a haul out for a uh, certificate of inspection. You're talking about, um, you know, surprise Coast Guard inspections. Um, you know, every every little bit it adds up. Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, Gloucester Schooner races. I think there were, I think there were only four um, last week that were over 120 feet, which is um, is, you know, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a new low, it's kind of a sobering experience, but, um, you know, at the same time, I mean, I have, I have an enormous amount of hope, um, after, after becoming director here, I've met, I've met some people that they have visions, they have, they have drive, and they have a love for these old vessels, and most importantly, they have lots and lots of money that they're willing to put into these boats. You know, these, um, these people, they're, you know, they, um, they see the same thing that we do when they look at an old tired boat. Um, and, uh, you know, the, some of these boats, I mean, but for the grace of God, go, go, we, you know, it's, um, it's tough to watch a boat slowly decay, but, um, you know, I, I've, I've devoted my entire life to, to trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, that's, that's how much I love them. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I think Chris too, that you make a good point. So a museum like Mystic Seaport Museum, like we are very fortunate, right, in this world, not only of having survived COVID by allowing people to still be able to come to our museum because we have, you know, we're an, mostly outdoor museums so we could be open, um, but we also are really fortunate that we have like a team of like 10, like designated people that are our development team and our advancement team to help um, find those special people who you know want to commit and um, and do commit uh, our board of trustees as well are just amazing people like we could not we could not be or do anything that we do now without um, support of people that yeah. really you know are just so generous with with you know their 
their ability to help us. Um, so it's, and it is, I, I know, cause I've had a chance to meet a few of them too. And they're just the loveliest, nicest people ever. And I just um, are so appreciative of all the, the work that certainly, you know, your shipyard, the shipwrights and work, but, but everyone. So um, yeah. we all think ourselves very fortunate for that too. And feel free to become one of those members too. So that, that also helps <laughs> us as well. Come down, you know, your ticket does a membership helps us out. Uh, it keeps, you know, it's not always the most exciting thing to keep the electricity running and all that, but we are, we we are a big expensive place to run but uh we're, we're doing we're doing really well but certainly can always can always welcome more people to to help us with that mission so we so again appreciate the time to kind of share some of our stories here with you all uh also just another open invitation um november 1st uh 2022 dates for our marina go open and live on dakwa uh so if you want to start planning uh some some trip down here we'd certainly uh, love to to see you and i'll i'll pull chris sanders away from his his uh his latest project to come and, and greet you all too if yeah. you can join us down here could i could i say something real quick um <clears throat> i know rebecca you flashed my my email up earlier if um if anybody attending tonight is interested in coming down and seeing the shipyard i it, i would it'd be my absolute pleasure to show you around um you know, I'm here six days a week, um, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you guys want to come down and check it out, just give me like 24 hours notice and I'll, I'll make it happen. I'll give you the behind the scenes tour and I'll show you all the cool stuff that the public doesn't get to see. <laughs> wow. That's, take advantage of that, my friends. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a was, great day. <laughs> I was there and Bruce Springsteen had his blue guitar next to us. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting weekend. And <laughs> you guys were the most gracious hosts in the world. Yeah, our dock crew are awesome. Yeah. Greg Zabel, our dock master, they are awesome people down there. Great. No, Glad to go, hear that. Thanks, Peg. Go, go. Was it blue guitar? Wasn't that owned by Eric Clapton at one point, too? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. He used to hang out in St. Michael's on that boat. It was really. Oh man, this guy and his crew were blasting music and it was only. In That's exactly what I remember. Band. Yeah. Oh, they couldn't God. sleep in St. Michael's. They were, they were so loud. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say your crew was the best I have ever seen. It was a little difficult to get up there, but it was the best place I can remember. Thank you. Uh, that makes yeah. us feel so good. Thanks for sharing that, Peg. Thank you on behalf of the Project Club for attending and uh, inspiring, hopefully, future generations. This is my daughter uh, to potentially come down and, and take a look and check it out. And Chris, uh, sometime, yeah. but just been great, far better, and far more insightful than I could have ever imagined with some of the stuff that you shared with us. So thank you. I appreciate your time. And um, my pleasure. Rick, um, actually, I'm going to ask a question. Um, yeah. Pat, what kind of hat do you want, Chris? What color? Oh, color? I need to know that. <laughs> what color? Tanner blue. Yeah, I was going to say you should qualify. That. Tanner blue. I, I love blue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right hey, you got you got the deal there i'll get you the address give me the uh, address i will send it in the mail all righty again right. thank you all. nice thank job you. everybody guys if you want thank you all. feel free but uh the presentation portion is over for the evening thanks chris and rebecca y'all have Take a great care. evening thank you thank you